Uh, please let me know if you have any questions on your exam um, and I'll be happy to redo any calculations that is needed. Surajit, what's your name? Han Wong? No. Oh, no, 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 mm -hmm. sorry. Bo Peng, no? No. See you Thank you. Lu Shen Tan. Thank you. Okay. I'm going to be grading the project uh, tomorrow, and then I'll upload those grades. And I'm going to upload the final grades by Saturday. So if you have any questions on any of the graded assignments, quizzes, exams, or whatever, let me know as soon as possible. <coughs> I have assignment six as well. What the hell? This is midterm two. Okay. Oh, assignment six. Bo Peng, Shiono Kim. Katie, Andrew, PG, Palaji, Sarah, Saurav, Brennan, Alex, Ruiki, Shinyi, Zhang, okay, so today we are going to talk about game theory and the idea in game theory is that you have two people who are each optimizing their own individual cost function or utility function. So what we were studying until now was single person optimization. So there is only one decision maker, there is only one object or system, and that's trying to minimize its own cost function. And we studied various algorithms that you could use to solve the single person optimization problem. We looked at two different types of optimization. One was static optimization, so you have a single cost function, one shot, come up with an iterative algorithm to solve the problem. And then we uh, looked into dynamic optimization problem. And of course, in dynamic optimization, there is quite a bit of things that happens. So we had uh, uh, open loop policy. We had closed loop policy. We used dynamic programming to compute the closed loop policy, and so on. So this is all single agent decision making. So either you are a one shot problem, optimization problem, or multi-stage optimization problem. Now. When you have two or more people, especially people, okay, so if you have two or more drones, they could act as a single agent because they both will share the same set of information or even if they have different set of information, they could work like a team and therefore solve a single agent optimization problem. But when you have two agents that are owned by two different human beings, okay, so it's only when human beings get involved when game theory becomes useful, okay? So you have two agents that are owned by human beings, or you have two human beings, and they both are selfish beings. They want to improve their own state of affairs. Uh, how would the, what would the outcome be? So game theory is a way to understand or come up with a normative theory as to what should the outcome be if you have two people who are competing against each other. So this is usually 
like if there is one sentence that summarizes game theory, it is analysis of conflict. So there has to be a conflict and we would like to analyze and understand how to resolve the conflict. Okay, so this, this idea is not new. It was studied by Borel and von Neumann in 1920s, mid to late 1920s. Um, so Borel studied the problem where you have two generals who have to allocate their resources, which is troops, over multiple battlefields. So how should they allocate? So whoever allocates more resources to a specific battlefield will win that battle, and therefore will win that. Uh, and if you win a lot of battles, then you win the overall war. Okay, so that was the problem Borel was interested in. It's the same Borel that you study in math classes. Okay, and then von Neumann was also a mathematician. In fact, he was an instrumental figure in the Manhattan Project, which built the first atomic bomb. Uh, so von Neumann was interested in economic systems and how agents interact within an economic system. And he came up with the idea of zero-sum game, where what one player loses is what other player gains. OK. And then, of course, we are going to go through several fundamental results in this area in today's class. So, uh, so let's go back to 1920s. Let's think what von Neumann was thinking by looking at markets, okay? So as human beings, uh, so I mean all of us are human beings, so I guess I can bank on your experience as well. So in the morning, you wake up and you want to eat breakfast and you have three items in your, in your house. A for apple, B for banana, and C for cat. No, people don't eat cat for breakfast. Uh, C for C for what? Cookies. Cookies. Okay, uh, that's a dessert, but it's fine. I, I think in in U.S. having dessert for breakfast is pretty common. So <laughs> let's have cookies. Okay, uh, D for donuts. Yeah. Okay. All right. So you have three items: uh, apple, banana, and cookies, and you want to eat something for breakfast. Um, how do you decide what you want to eat? How do you decide? Okay, so individually we all have preferences and we eat according to our preferences. Okay, so some of you might eat cookie because you prefer cookie over apples and bananas. They might sound like a boring breakfast item to you. Okay, but someone else who is perhaps more health conscious, like me, or like how, uh, they would prefer to eat uh, maybe apple or banana, right? So depending upon whether they want vitamin C or they want more carbohydrate in their diet. So humans have, have preferences over alternatives. So I have three alternatives here, A, B, and C, and I have preference. I have preference over these alternatives that I have. And the preferences would usually be denoted by A is preferred, so A is less than B is less than C. So this is like a curved less than equal to less than sign, or you could have equal to as well, okay? So this means that I prefer C over B, and I prefer B over A, okay? So over all the alternatives that you may have, you will have a preference order over those alternatives. So I like a sunny day, I prefer a sunny day over a rainy day, and I prefer a rainy day over a cold day, okay? So I have a preference relationship among all the alternatives that I have. But this is not very mathematical. This doesn't really lead us to an optimization algorithm or optimization problem. So von Neumann in 1920s faced this problem. So how do we, 
how do we as ascribe a number to each of these preferences? Okay, so once everything gets formulated in terms of numbers, then we can do math on it, we can do calculations on it, we can put it in the computer, run some algorithms and so on. So we have to ascribe numbers to a rainy day, a sunny day, and a cold day. So he had to come up with an axiomatic theory for how to, how to ascribe a number or a utility to each of these preferences. So he had to make some assumptions on the preferences. So this is a simple alternative. And he constructed compound alternative. What do you think would a compound alternative be? I pick one alternative with prob some probability and something else with another probability. Okay, so that's a compound alternative. So P A plus one minus P B, which means in the morning I have to pick between apple and banana, uh, and I'm going to toss a coin with which has a biased bias of P. So it comes up head with probability P, comes up tails with probability one minus P. So I toss a coin, if it is head, I'm going to eat apple. If it is tails, I'm going to eat banana, okay? So that's a compound alternative, which is strictly larger than a simple alternative. So you have a set of simple alternatives, and then you can generate a, lot of, a, a large class of compound alternatives from the simple alternatives. So now you have A, which is the set of all alternatives, which includes both simple as well as compound alternatives. And they satisfy certain axioms. So, so the one is complete, which means that if you have three alternatives, A1, A2, and A3 in A, then either A1 is less than A2, or A2 is less than A1, or A1 is similar to A2. Okay? So I can always compare any two alternatives. Like I can pick the better alternative, or both of them have to be the same alternative. Like there should not be any problem between any two alternatives. The second is transitive, which means if A1 is less than A2 and A2 is less than A3, then this implies that A1 is less than A3. So if I like, if I like banana over apple and I like cookie over banana, then I like cookie over apple as well, okay? Continuity. So, A1 less than, A2 less than, A3 implies there exists P between zero and one such that PA1 plus one minus PA3 is similar to A2. So there exists a probability P such that I have, I'm indifferent between eating a banana or with some probability eating a cookie and with probability one minus P cooking, uh, eating an apple. Okay, so that's the continuity assumption. The fourth is independence of alternatives, which is 
L is less, no, A1 is less than A2 implies PA1 plus 1 minus PA3 is preferred, is uh, less preferred than PA2 plus 1 minus PA3. Do you think your decision rules satisfy these axioms in the morning? Your preferences about what to eat when you wake up, do they satisfy these axioms? It's difficult to know, right? Okay, so we don't know whether these axioms are satisfied, well, no. Uh, by now, um, of course, this was proposed back in 1920s and 30s. Uh, nowadays, we have ample psychological evidence that we don't satisfy many of these axioms. Particularly, independence of alternatives is something that we do not satisfy. So, so in short, the human decision making does not satisfy these alternatives, but this was the first model for um, the assumptions on preference relationship, which if these, if the preference relationship satisfy this assumption, then something cool happens, something big happens. So what's the big result here? Von Neumann and Morgan Stern. So they proved the following result. There exists a function u from a to r such that a1 is less than equal to a1 is preferred over a2 if and only if expected value of u of a1 is less than equal to expected value of u of a2 or let me put it strict less than yeah so how is the expected value defined so if a1 is p1 of b1 plus 1 minus plus p2 of b2 plus p3 of p3 then expected value of u of a1 is p1 u of v1 plus p2 u of v2 so these are simple alternatives and so for each of these simple alternatives you have a specific utility function defined and then you can define the utility function over a compound uh, alternative by the summing up the utility uh, according to the appropriate probability weighing function. Okay, so the benefit of this result is now I can ascribe numbers to alternatives that I have. And if now if I want to make a decision, all I have to do is I have to pick a, an alternative that maximizes my expected utility. And therefore, it implies that, um, so at that point of time, it was thought that humans are utility maximizers or expected utility maximizers and we always want to maximize our utility um, among all possible alternatives that is given. Okay. So is that is that clear? That's the reason why this, this uh, theorem is important. Of course, by now, there are maybe 20 different theorems 
which refines some of these axioms and comes up with a much more elaborate definition of this utility function. Um, the most important of which has been prospect theory, which I don't know if any of you have heard about it. So uh, people who propose prospect theory to economists, not economists actually, they were psychologists. Uh, they received the Nobel Prize in economics back in 2008 or nine or something like that. Um, and they basically, they're, of course, they're, 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 the set of work that they have done is pretty big, but what they essentially said, one of the crux of their work is that actually human decision makers, they, um, they distort the probability uh, assigned to every alternative, okay? So to give you an example, if you're playing, if you're gambling on something, the, or, or if you're playing a lottery, uh, the probability of you winning the jackpot is extremely small, but people still buy lotteries because they think that they are more lucky, they are luckier than other people. So they have distorted the probability in their favor. Um, and that's how they make their decision. So that's, that's their, uh, one of the key points or key outcomes of their research. And they have collected data from actual human experiments over very long periods of time. And this is something that they have proposed that actually human decision maker distorts the probability. That's the reason why we buy insurance because the probability of you getting into a car crash is very, very small, but you still have to have insurance because if you do get into a crash, then you will have to suddenly pay 100000 or $200,000 worth of expenses. And therefore, uh, we distort the probability, we, we, we change the probability of getting into a car crash and paying $100,000, and therefore we buy insurance. But otherwise, uh, if we had not amplified the risks or amplified the gains uh, in terms of probabilities, we would never buy insurance and we would never buy lotteries. If we, were, if we had these set of axioms, then we would never actually buy insurance or buy lotteries, but we do, and therefore, human decision makers don't really satisfy their alternatives or preference relations don't really satisfy these axioms. But it's still a good analytical vehicle and most of the game theory is based on this fundamental result that you see on the board. Okay. Let's look at a very simple game where we have two decision makers, husband and wife, and they have a, or, or boyfriend and girl, girlfriend or whatever, you know, two people, two friends, and they all have different, they both have different preferences, and there are two alternatives, football, I guess this example will resonate with the crowd here. So football and opera. So this is known as battle of the sexes. So you have player one um, and you have two alternatives for player one, football and opera. And then you have player two football and opera. So the alternatives here are, both of you, both player one and player two go to football match together. Player one goes to football match, player two goes for an opera. So they are going separately. And the same thing, player one goes for opera, player two goes for football separately, and then they could go to opera together. Okay, so this is a match we play every Saturday in my house. Okay, so I don't want to go to football <laughs> and my wife doesn't want to go to opera, she wants to go to movies and I want to work. <laughs> Complete the grading for project or assignment or you know, write my papers. So this is a match we play every Saturday, okay? Uh, so you can, you can change it to whatever you want, homework versus going out and having beer or something. All right, so what's the, payoff that each of these players get. So in this case, they get 3, 2, 0, 0, 0, 0, and 2, 3. So what does that mean? If they go separately to their individual events, uh, they don't actually derive any benefit. They don't like it, okay? So player one gets zero 
benefit, player two gets zero benefit, so these are payoffs. So player one gets zero payoff, player two gets zero payoff because they have gone separately to their individual events. So same thing happens here. But when player one goes to football and player two goes to football, so player one derives benefit of magnitude three, so that's the payoff. But player two doesn't really like football that much, and therefore um, she derives a benefit of only two. Now same thing happens here, player one doesn't really like opera, so I'm always playing this game, okay? So I don't really like movies, but I still have to go for movies because my wife said so. And of course my wife enjoys it more, so then she, she has fun um, at the movie. Okay, so now the question is what should be done in this situation? Okay, what's, uh, what is the outcome that you will see on a day-to-day -day basis? So that was the question that game theorists asked back in 1920s and 30s. What do you think would happen? Okay, so just think about it while I raise, and then tell me what would, what would an outcome of this game be? Okay, so you're saying half-half. Okay, so some, who said half-half? Okay, he said half-half. What about others? Is there a sequence that P1 picks first and P3 picks? No, there is no sequence. This is a static game, so they both have to pick together. So do you Um, no, there is no normalization. Even if you normalize, it doesn't really matter. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, these are all probabilities. So P1 plus P2 plus P3 is equal to 1. Yeah. So you only care about yourself? Yeah, each of them care only about themselves. Yeah. The game's only played once. Well, Technically, you play it on an everyday basis, but you sort of decouple the past and the future, and you just look at a single stage at this point of time. I'll get into the dynamic game part later, but right now we are just looking at a static game, just like we were looking at static optimization. <clears throat> so I kind of got the answer already. So you essentially toss a coin and you pick option one according to some probability and option two according to some other probability. Okay, so each player uses independent randomization. Okay, so when my wife says, do you want to go to a movie? I just go to MATLAB, run a command rand, <laughs> and then pick an option with some probability. <laughs> All right, so each player uses independent randomization. So player one plays according to P and one minus P. Player two plays according to Q, one minus Q. Okay, now according to this theorem, I already know the utility of individual alternatives, so I can compute the payoffs that each individual is going to get. If P1 plays according to this, this strategy and P2 plays according to this strategy. So this is, the, uh, this is known as mixed strategy. So what would the payoff to player one be expected payoff to P1? That's uh, PQ multiplied by three plus one minus P, one minus Q multiplied to two. And then the expected payoff to P2 is PQ2 plus one minus P, one minus Q, three. So 
So I compute the probability of each of these events happening. And of course, you get a payoff of zero here and zero here. So those terms cancel out. The utility for that is zero. And then you're only left with two terms. So PQ is the probability that you will be in this quadrant. One minus P, one minus Q is the probability that you will be in this quadrant. Okay. Now someone said 50-50. Let's see what happens when you do 50-50. So, okay, so let's even before we go to 50-50, what should the notion of equilibrium be? What should, what should the agents do? What do you think should, so if you are in a situation where you have two parties and both of them have their own payoff functions based on what you do and based on what they pick, uh, what would be an optimal outcome from your perspective? Yes. Uh, let's assume that you know Q. Okay, so he's, so let me call this U1 of P comma Q. Let me call this U2 of P comma Q. And he's saying that if I know Q, so let's say Q star, then player one is going to maximize over P in zero comma one of u1 of p comma q star. Is that right? Okay, so player two is also going to do the same thing. So player two will maximize q in 0, 1, u2 of p star comma q. When will the solution to this, these two optimization problems be consistent? So how many of you agree that this should be the case? This seems like a reasonable thing to do in this scenario. So if I know the strategy of the other person, I play my best response, and the same thing happens for the other player as well. So pretty much everyone agrees that this is, this looks pretty good, good solution concept. Now, when will this solution concept be consistent? Okay, yeah, let me make it argmax. So when will this be consistent? Alex, you want to give it a shot? When will this set of optimization problems be consistent or give you consistent answers? So this, when this is equal to P star and this is equal to Q star, right? So if P star satisfies this and Q star satisfies this, then it leads to a consistent outcome because this expects the other player to play according to P star and therefore it plays Q star and this one expects player two to behave according to Q star and therefore will play P star, okay? So this leads to a consistent set of strategies and I'm sorry to say Alex, but you were born in the wrong century. So this is exactly what Nash proposed in 1951 and in a beautiful paper and he proved that such an equilibrium exists in games and then he won the Nobel Memorial Prize for Economics in 1993. So you are, you are late to the game. 